Well, welcome back to the Waiting Room Revolution. Today, we are very excited to have Claire Snyman on our show from Vancouver, British Columbia. She is a brain tumor survivor. She's a patient advocate. She's an author. And we're excited to chat with her, learn about her experiences and how they intersect with the Waiting Room Revolution. Hi, I'm Sien Xiao. And I'm Sammy Winemaker. We talk to people who have information and tips on how to unlock a better illness experience. The Waiting Room Revolution starts right now. So welcome, Claire. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks so much for having me on today. Um, I'm excited to be here because I've been listening to your podcast. Um, I'm very grateful for the work that you're both doing in this important space. And uh, yes, I'm excited for the conversation and how it will unfold today. So are we. <laughs> so, well, yeah, welcome. So for some of our listeners who may not know you, Claire, I know mm -hmm. you're active on social media, but can you tell us briefly a bit about your backstory as a patient? Sure, absolutely. So where to start? So let me take you back to, I think, where was it? May 2010. Well, that seems a long time ago, eternity ago. So that's really where my brain tumor patient story began. Um, I had the sudden onset of vertigo. So the room was spinning around for me. I woke up one morning um, and it was followed by onset of a migraine. And I never had headaches before in my life. So this was an unusual presentation. Um, and it continued for a couple of days. And after seeing my family physician, uh, uh, she recommended I go to the emergency room. And this led to a rather abrupt sort of diagnosis in the ER of my local hospital in that backless blue gown on my own to that of a rare non-malignant uh, brain tumor. And at that stage, I was 34 years old, a wife and a mother of a four-year-old uh, son. And um, I was put on a treatment regime of what's called watch and wait which means that I didn't need surgery, I didn't need any other treatment, but what I needed was yearly MRIs, um, and that was what was going to happen. Um, but there's, let me tell you, there's nothing sort of uh, easy about watching and waiting something inside your brain that's not really supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's very much like the metaphorical waiting room that we're talking about in the revolution. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, uh, that was a hard thing for me to do, let me say, um, trying to deal with a lot of uncertainty. Um, around that uh, treatment of watch and wait. Um, and I had to very quickly learn how to navigate, I think, the healthcare system because I went from being, let's say, a, a sort of a normal patient or routine patient to being someone who now had, had multiple medications. I had multiple appointments, multiple specialists. And it really took a new level of sort of, of navigation and monitoring, um, which I was glad for because uh, about... Two years later, that watch and wait changed. Um, and my brain tumor doubled in size. And it blocked the flow of the fluid in my brain. And so my brain started to swell. And I had a condition which is called hydrocephalus. And um, that required uh, emergency brain surgery. And so I had that to remove my tumor and to reduce the swelling in my brain. And after that, I also developed a condition called aseptic or chemical meningitis as well. And so, you know, after all of that, it took my brain, it took me a long time to recover. It took me about 18 months to recover from all of that because of all the cumulative impacts on my brain. Mm -hmm. And I have, I have a brain injury as a result um, of, of all of that that really happened. Um, and so... That's, I suppose, my patient journey through the, the uh, having, having had a brain tumor and having multiple MRIs after having had it removed to make sure it didn't recur. And now, I suppose, where am I now? I'm almost, almost 10 years, pretty much since my removal. Um, and along that journey, I've, I've had to learn quite a few things. Um, how to create a new normal for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I've met some amazing people along the way, uh, inspirational people mm -hmm. who've really impacted my life. Um, I've had to, as I said, learn to navigate the healthcare system. Um, and I think really make time my friend, not my enemy um, in my recovery. I can't help but wonder when you were first diagnosed, Claire, mm. um, when you were on this watch and wait kind of treatment, um, which I would think would be just a living hell in a way. Um, mm. 
But did you ever ask or did they ever offer to you what, you know, once you're over the relief of nothing needs to be done right now and we're going to watch and wait, did they offer you what the natural possibilities might be down the road or did they just say, okay, we're going to watch and wait and we'll do the MRIs or did they give you this nice picture of what could and might happen? You know, it's, it's really interesting because I, I love that you bring that up because I think that speaks to uh, one of the things that you guys have spoken about in your podcast is, is that overall that like roadmap that yeah. giving people the, the zoom out of the, the patient journey yeah. um, and what does that look like? And when I was diagnosed in the ER, as I said, it was rather abrupt. It was a neurologist who said to me, oh, we think you've got viral meningitis. And oh, by the way, you've got a brain tumor and walked out. And I was like, what? Mm -hmm. And then I was also given a 10 minute consult thereafter with a neurosurgeon Mm -hmm. who actually did lay out that roadmap for Mm me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I saw him thereafter two weeks later Mm -hmm. where it was the roadmap of it will be watch and wait it is the size of it is right now we're watching wait to see if it grows and then if it does grow to around about this size we will remove it and so forth so I did have a lie of the land Mm -hmm. Um, I was told that these are the type of symptoms I should look for which might indicate it as growing and so forth so I did have an idea of what that roadmap would look like, which would ultimately land up with the end point of surgery. So I sort of had, this is my beginning point. This is my end point. Yeah. Um, however, I felt like maybe there was, so I had a roadmap, but I felt like there was maybe a side road, which wasn't yeah. detailed very well to me. In fact, I think it was left out of the roadmap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and this was my experience, but having chatted to a lot of other individuals affected by brain tumors, I feel like that side road is not unique to me alone. And that is that side road had a lot of potholes. It had a lot of diversions and even some road closures, I felt like sometimes. <laughs> and that was that side road was all about the mental health challenges mm. that could affect an individual um, who had a brain tumor. So from my diagnosis up till my surgery and after my surgery, um, mental health challenges were most definitely there, but were never once mentioned Mm -hmm. from diagnosis all the way from even surgery and even after surgery, not once was that ever mentioned. Mm -hmm. So when I did have things that impacted me mentally, I thought, what's going on? Is this me? And I didn't know where to reach for support. And I felt that that was a miss in the roadmap that was laid out to me. Did, did you feel suspended at all for those 18 months, like just floating around a little bit without knowing where to land, like unable to plan? You were a young mom of a young um, child. Was it difficult for life to go on as usual and for you to plan without having an anchor? Absolutely. Um, I mean, for me, when I was diagnosed, um, I was diagnosed during the day. Um, My husband came to the ER with me, but stepped out. And then I was told I had a brain tumor and then he stepped back in. I only got home, I think at 6 p.m. that night and we'd been able to get a babysitter um, to look after my son who was four years old. But you know, the first thing that I thought of when I was told I had a brain tumor was of my husband and son. Yes. Because I thought, am I going to, this brings tears to my eyes. I thought, am I going to grow old with my husband? Am I going to be able to see my son graduate high school and all those type of things? Because one of the side effects or, you know, in stages potentially of my brain tumor was some things when I'd read on stats were not looking good (laughs) when I went down that little visit with Dr. Google myself. And um, so that suspension that you talk about, Mm -hmm. yes, was I had many moments where I went down that dark vortex where I wondered and had a lot of moments of uncertainty Mm -hmm. where I felt like, do I move on or do I stay in this point moment of time? But 
I suddenly realized that what I needed to do was surround myself with a solid and robust medical team Mm -hmm. that were able to give me the best and most accurate sort of care that I needed. Mm -hmm. Um, And I did that. I got that. I even got a second opinion to make sure that I had the right diagnosis and the right treatment and way forward. And I felt that that made me feel the most secure in what was happening to me with my treatment and um, way forward. And that made me feel less uncertain. Mm -hmm. Um, So every headache that I got, every vertigo spell that I got, I didn't think, oh my God, my brain tumor is out of control. And that helped me live more in the moment than the what ifs. You uh, mentioned that the first thing you thought about was, will I grow old with my husband and what will I see my son graduate? Mm-hmm. But really reading between the lines, you're wondering if you're going to die. Mm-hmm. Um, is that something that you came right out and asked when you were first diagnosed? Like, is this the kind of tumor that a person like me can die from? I didn't. Mm-hmm. I didn't actually ask that straight up. Um, and it's interesting because As I said, the situation when I was in the the emergency department was not ideal to Mm -hmm. ask that. Mm -hmm. Um, It was, I was almost brushed off in a way that was like, oh, it's fine. You'll be fine. It's not a big deal from the neurologist. The neurosurgeon was a little bit more serious about it. Mm -hmm. And then I was sent to go home. Um, I think it was, it's interesting also, I found because potentially, maybe because it was non-malignant, mm-hmm. I was, um, it wasn't deemed to be such a dramatic issue. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, the way it panned out, I could have died, mm-hmm. but I didn't turn him here, which is great. <laughs> I know that you've mm-hmm. listened, you've, you've uh, tweeted a lot about some of the keys, the seven keys that we came up with, and one of mm-hmm. them was Zoom out your to. Were there others that you felt were very relevant to your story that you um, had wished you had known sooner or that you would want to tell other people affected by brain tumors or brain injury that Mm -hmm. um, would help them? So there's definitely one that speaks very much to me personally um, is (laughs) Tagurit. And I love that one because... I think a lot of people don't realize the intricacies of the healthcare system Mm -hmm. um, until they become a patient or because until maybe someone, a loved one becomes a patient. And I think then sometimes it becomes a bit of a shock. It's like, wow, I don't realize that the healthcare system was so complex. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really great that you highlight this as a key and and really pull it out um, because there's so many different silos in healthcare um, and so many silos with amazing people working within them but they're just not well connected. And I was surprised. I thought, oh, one person will know what the other person's doing and my case report will go from one place to another, but not, did not happen. Um, And it was interesting because I, straight after I was diagnosed, um, I actually automatically started tracking my symptoms in a little black book that I had Mm -hmm. uh, because my memory actually was already a problem prior to my diagnosis, I didn't realize, but that's actually one of the issues with the brain tumor that I had. So I started tracking my symptoms so that I could, you know, when I went to appointments, I figured out what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I started asking for copies of the CT scan that I had the MRI report and the CDs. And in fact, I have everything here in a binder um, because I'm going through another neurological issue at the moment. And I think I have all 20 of my MRI CDs and everything so that I could actually track it. And I only realized that things weren't connecting in the system when I went to one of my appointments and the person said, the specialist said, oh, thank goodness you bought it because I don't have a copy of your latest Mm -hmm. whatever report or the MRI it was. Mm -hmm. So I I really like Tagurit um, because I think it allows people to understand just how important their contributions are Mm -hmm. as whether it's a patient or a caregiver. Because sometimes I think it's important that patients sometimes necessarily can't be the the true custodian, Mm -hmm. um, whether it's due to health condition or for myself as a brain injury, as an individual with a brain injury, my husband is integral in knowing my healthcare, my patterns at home, everything like that. He adds tremendous insight 
I mean, I may look like, hey, everything's just okay. Mm -hmm. But by the end of the day, everything's not just okay. He knows all the intricacies and the details. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that's really important. Um, And I think also with the COVID pandemic, it's actually really even highlighted more and more the importance of people trying to really super glue those dots together Mm -hmm. because it's even more fragmented and the system is even more burden than it was before so for me I mean it was funny uh after I went through this whole um sort of journey and what I did is as a health advocate I actually teamed what I call a team approach to help me remember what I need to do because I still have a lot of health conditions so it was I've got to track everything I've got to educate myself I've got to ask questions and I've got to manage my health care because otherwise I forget what I've got to do and so that resonated for me with tagger it's like you, mm-hmm. you got to get in there and and figure out what's going on so I love that one um <laughs> I thought you were going to say I loved the one that was called know your style because you clearly have a certain style mm-hmm. <laughs> you have a great style but no you have a, a style about you yep. that is organized and Um, likes to plan and, you know, Mm -hmm. have information and Mm -hmm. know what's happening. And you were true to yourself throughout your illness. Um, I I have a question about, um, you mentioned something about it's been 10 years now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Since the surgery? Um, 10, yeah, coming up to 10 years. That's right. Coming up to, well, happy anniversary, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, do you still feel like you have one foot in the waiting room? That's a really good question. Um, because uh, I think as an individual who personally as an individual who's had a brain tumor and just recently had sort of a resurge of symptoms and I'm like, oh, what is this bit like out of the normal? My first thought is, has it come back? Mm-hmm. and having to walk down that road again and it hasn't which is great um but I think that I don't necessarily have the waiting room situation with regards to brain tumor but having a brain injury um I deal with a whole different set of uh parameters and uh specialists and so forth that and conditions I suppose um, so I think I, I do have one step in the waiting room. Yes. Do you, do you still feel, you know, I, I know some friends who have gone through serious illnesses um, mm-hmm. that are cured, uh, but for years and years later, they all, it's always sitting on their shoulder. Like, yes. you know, every twinge yes. is that until proven otherwise. Does that, yes. does that volume of that vigilance and you know, constantly scanning yourself, does, does that dissipate year by year? I did find it did. Yeah, it did for sure. And I used to, I used to have MRIs every, uh, it was every year after my surgery and then every two years and then they stopped and that was quite a thing. They said, okay, I think you're good now. It can stop. And I was like, Oh, I'm not sure how I feel about that. (laughs) And then it stopped. And then I had a resurge of symptoms about three years ago and then they MRI'd me and then a resurge of symptoms uh, just two months ago and then they MRI'd me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's, it's, it does, it becomes a sense of just being aware of what your body looks like in the norm, as that norm looks, mm-hmm. but then knowing when it steps outside and being comfortable to put your hand up um, and know what that looks like. But mm-hmm. I mean, as, as within the, the community, there is that term scanxiety when yeah. you have to go and have that. And it's not a nice place to sit and to, to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what does that look like? And, and how quickly can you get your scan in? And how quickly do you get your results? And then, and then the what ifs. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that will be a reality probably for the rest of my life. It's mm-hmm. not going to go away. It's how do you live with that? Yeah. And um And yes, and I think a sense of health anxiety comes with it Mm -hmm. in general. um, And that is something that I've had to learn to work with. Mm -hmm. One of our most important keys is about walk two roads, which is hope for the best and plan for the rest. And we talk about that for the patient, but also their family. So I'm curious in your experience, 
How did that key walk to Rhodes play out for your husband and your son? Yeah, so that was interesting because obviously when I was diagnosed, my son was four. So not much that you can explain to a four-year-old. Um, all I wanted to know was, could he dial 911? In case mm -hmm. mommy fell on the floor, did mm -hmm. you know how to dial 911? And that's as far as it went for a four-year-old. Mm. Um, when he was six and I had to have emergency surgery, then we explained to him what was happening. Uh, the trajectory looked a bit different as over the next 18 months when I was still recovering, he was six, seven, seven and a half. But even now, <laughs> as I am, he's 15 and a half and I'm obviously, I'm as recovered as I'll be, but I have brain injuries. So I forget things and walk into things and I'm asleep by nine o'clock. And yeah, it's, yeah, but it's become more of a, sometimes a, a laughing running matter in our household when I'm talking about the wrong thing. And he's like, oh, mom, really? Um, but I think it's a sense of, it's become more of a, we, we understand in our house that a headache is not a, doesn't equal a bad outcome. A headache equals a headache. And mom has vertigo doesn't mean that she has a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. It's, we understand that's the net, the progression of mom's. Uh, it's also my brain injury. Um, and it's also, I have migraines. Um, so I think we prepare, you know, we, we uh, hope for the best. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to have, a, uh, given that um, there is some anxiety around it and having children in the house as well, I think it's important to keep a, healthy dose of positivity mm -hmm. but as you said also understand that life happens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what i've heard is a lot of this of the the keys the seven keys are very similar to a lot of serious illnesses but i guess the flip of that is what is unique about having a brain injury or brain tumor that um, is unlike you know mm -hmm. cancer or you know heart failure I think it's a great question and it's it's a little hard one to answer because I think every health sort of condition is unique and, and carries its own burden um, and at the same time everyone's experience of for example brain injury journey is unique to them but I suppose from my own experience um, for me the symptoms of like a brain injury are not visible to the eye um, so for me anything from like cognitive issues memory could be anything like depression loss of balance problems thinking the fatigue that comes with it mm. um they're not visible to the eye um and they they're not easily cured or even treated by medications either so it's not like well that's great this is what we can do and we'll tick that box and you should be fine and this is the roadmap that you'll get mm. it's more a sense of a change in lifestyle um mm -hmm and an acceptance and a move on um not move on that's not the right word um and i think with that comes the challenge sometimes of invisible disabilities mm. um the almost the acceptance and understanding by have the healthcare profession as well as by families and friends um i it, i i i like to use the saying is that memory loss um, is not just uh, menopause or old age mm -hmm. and that sounds really strange to say but um, uh, sometimes out of best intentions if I'm talking to some of my very wonderful friends um, you know I might be saying oh sorry I forgot that and like, oh, don't worry I forget things all the time menopause and I'm like I'm not, not quite the same <laughs> just every single day that's why I have an apple watch that's why everything of mine is electronic and connected all the way because I can't remember maybe what happened yesterday or my long-term memory a lot of it is gone so it's it's a little bit different with the brain injury and I think um, often even if I look at a brain tumor and brain injury and not everyone who's had a brain tumor has a brain injury at all um, but if I look at a brain tumor sometimes when you finish the treatment with surgery chemo radiation sometimes the symptoms or the, the treatment might leave lifelong challenges mm -hmm. um, that exist mm -hmm. um, and it might be those invisible disabilities mm -hmm. um, and I think that is sometimes a challenge. I mean, I know after my uh, surgery, um, I had 
you know, the hole in my head, but I could cover it over my, my hair, could cover it. Um, my face looked like a moon from all the steroids. Um, but I, I looked I looked pretty okay. Mm-hmm. Most people were like, oh, wow, you look great. You must be fine. But mm-hmm. inside, I was, I was not okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was not okay for a very long time. Um, and so I think that's maybe what might be a little bit different um, mm-hmm. from some of the other trajectories and illnesses. Mm-hmm. So Claire, I'd love to hear your advice for someone dealing with memory issues associated with a brain injury. Yes, you know what? The one I've got here, I'll just show you here. Just see what yeah. this says. Talk slowly. Mm. Mm. So you see, I have a, that's reminding me while I'm yes. here now. I have a lot of, um, I, I use a lot of electronic things to remind me uh, for my cognitive issues, memory issues. Um, there's a lot of different online things that you can use to help you with your memory issues. Um, it's a, it's, I'm actually going to write a blog on this about mm-hmm. cognitive issues. And I'm actually writing a new book on uh, dealing with, it's called Alphabet Soup. So I'm hoping to bring some new stuff here. But quick tips on cognitive issues and memory issues are write things down. Don't just rely on electronics. I have electronics, but I write things down in a diary too, because when we write, we actually reinforce it in our brain. We're too reliant on electronics these days. So try to do a bit of both, not just one. This is not the same, but you just twigged my memory this week. I saw a patient who um, physically looks quite well, but has a mm. very serious illness and uh, a cute little vignette. As I was leaving, um, it was in an apartment building and walking down the hallway, she stood at her door um, my back was to her and she's, and she yelled, I'm not as good as I look. Everyone says I look, <laughs> she, she was so worried that I wasn't going to appreciate um, what struggles she was going through because she looked so good. And everyone must say to her the same thing, Claire, oh, yeah. you look great because people yeah. naturally want to be cheerleaders and positive, awesome. right? Oh, Claire, you look so beautiful. You look wonderful. Look at you. You're our hero. Yeah. Oh my goodness. You're so strong. And inside mm-hmm. you're thinking, okay, this sucks. I'm not myself. I feel awful. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. I guess I'm supposed to smile. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's, it's funny because when you get together with, I mean, I told, still attend brain tumor support group. Mm-hmm. um I still have I input well in person on the zoom box mm-hmm. and um you know online as well and often I find that when you chat to people are like oh my gosh that's when you can really have the conversation mm-hmm. and people are like oh that's that's exactly what you're saying is that people all look we all look at each other and we're like oh you're looking good but behind the the mask Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff going on. And I think that, apl- that applies actually to a lot of conditions, yeah. not just brain injury, brain tumor. And I think that's something to really be a- aware of. And I became aware of that. I think every, every health condition I've had mm-hmm. has taught me something mm-hmm. about somebody else. I'm glad that you mentioned your idea of learning and then, you know, teaching others. Cause I, you took your experience and you, you wrote about your first experience, two steps forward in your book. Um, embracing life with a brain tumor. You went on to do a TEDx talk, which is well watched. And that led to the second book, right? Activate, how to save mm-hmm. your life in a complex health system. And so I'm curious because there's some alignment in our mission here to take our past experience, teach others mm-hmm. who have walked, uh, you know, who are starting that journey, but, you know, sharing experience of people who have um, walked that road before and particularly the activation, right? The, the, mm-hmm. the book called Activate, which is what we're trying to do to invite people, invite yourself to the conversation. Mm-hmm. What, what did you learn from, that experience. I mean, obviously, you know, people should pick up the book, read it, but what did you learn from writing it, that whole experience and, and from the audience who, who, who read it and, and, and came back to you? Did you learn something different than what you had intended to put out? So, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, I'll take a step back as to why I actually wrote it and what happened there. So I wrote it alongside doing my TEDx talk. And the reason why I did my TEDx talk was I had a message I wanted to get out. Mm -hmm. And that message goes back to my patient journey where I experienced a rather tumultuous sort of navigation of the healthcare system where I realized, oh, you know, it's not that uh, seamless 
uh, mm-hmm. healthcare system that exists, I really needed to step up and get involved there. Um, I actually had medical error and misdiagnosis that happened just before my surgery. Uh, and if I hadn't been an activated patient, well, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Mm-hmm. And after I had recovered enough, I obviously wrote two steps forward and then take that a couple of years later, I was like, I look back on my patient journey. I'm like, well, how did I get to where I got to? And I started to read a lot about patient activation, you know, what that really meant and the fact that it meant that individuals had the knowledge, the skills and the confidence to actually be participants in their healthcare. And I was like, that makes a lot of sense because that's what I was doing. I think we spoke earlier about the fact that I used to be tracking everything, asking questions. I read up so much on my brain tumor once I was diagnosed that I could have a conversation with a neurosurgeon when I went in. And so I looked for avenues to share that message because I wanted, I felt it was so important because for me, if I hadn't done that, I would have died. And so that was my message. I was like, how to navigate or how to get out there because you never know, you might save a life. It might be yours or it might be somebody you love. And that's what I did. I took it out. I took it out to the TEDx platform, and I wrote the book Activate to accompany it and to go out there. Um, And in that book, it talks about the team approach, which we just spoke about, which was the tracking, the educating yourself, the asking questions, and the managing your healthcare. Well, you know, I'm picking up on something uh, that you said that you didn't highlight, I think, um, enough, (laughs) which was the ability to go through the TEAM approach mm. as the care partner was so important instrumentally for you. Yeah. Um, and it's an instrumentally important for all patients and care partners or caregivers. Mm-hmm. But, and you, you mentioned just for a, a snippet there, how important it is emotionally to be able to feel that you have some sense of control in a, when you can't control the, the tumor, you can't control yeah. often the illness, but what you can control is the amount, you know, like being in the know. And it, we always say um, when we're talking about our podcast, how important knowledge is and how powerful knowledge is. And uh, even if it's for better or for worse, uh, knowing things is so empowering, um, makes people feel so much more prepared to make the next decision. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're big advocates, just like Mm -hmm. you, Claire, on Mm -hmm. activating people so that they get the information that they need both instrumentally and emotionally. Um, but you know, sometimes people will say to us, but I'm just naturally not like that. I'm a day-to-day person. I, I tend not to do that. And that scares me. It overwhelms me. Mm-hmm. So w- would you like, so our advice is always not everyone in the core group has to be the team, the yes. team AM approach, but you have, don't, do you feel like you have to have at least one person you know, in the um, family team, in quotations, that has to be that person. Yeah, I think so. I think so, because I think otherwise that something will become a shock. Yeah. Um, Something in that roadmap and journey Mm -hmm. will be a big shock. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's important that the knowns are known Mm -hmm. um, because... That's how, that's how you overcome the complexity and the intricacies of the healthcare system. I think is by somebody within the care group, the care mm-hmm. team, and I'm talking about the patient family caregiver care team, yeah. um, knowing about the, or being responsible for tracking, educating, asking, managing the parts of mm-hmm. the patient journey. I think it's fundamental. And I think it can be scary. There's a huge burden of care that comes with that. Mm-hmm. I know some days I sit here and I'm like, oh my gosh, today was a hard day mm-hmm. because I spent two hours basically doing admin on my healthcare mm-hmm. because I was mm-hmm. phoning this, I was doing that, I was looking at this and I was like, geez, and I also work part-time. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I can't work full time because of my lovely brain. But mm-hmm. I'm like, that was a hard day. So mm-hmm. I can imagine for a lot of people, it's the task seems pretty onerous. But I think it's all about starting in small blocks and understanding if you do the small blocks along the way, it's not one massive big block when it suddenly comes down on your desk. That's um, a good segue into my next question Ooh. for you. But because I think that's the answer, actually, is so many people tell us that when we suggest that they be, you know, um, respectfully assertive in, in their care journey, many people say, well, I, do, I, I don't want to piss off the doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want it to jeopardize my care. I know they're busy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't want to interrupt them. And so, and I can only get them for two seconds, but I think what you just said is the answer, unless you have more to contribute, which is this idea of um, starting at the beginning and doing little bits and pieces of, you know, coming to the healthcare system and mm-hmm. collecting and managing the bits as opposed to ignoring that piece. And then Mm -hmm. at one appointment say, oh, I'd like my CTs from 10 years ago, my MRIs from the last five years. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I have these 100 questions that Mm -hmm. like spreading it at knowing from the beginning, you have to be like that. And just being that way along the whole journey, Mm -hmm. is that less likely to derail the system? Mm -hmm. I think so. And I mean, I know when I go in for question or an appointment um i mean for example i had multiple pulmonary embolisms last year um so i had to have uh, multiple appointments to help that out um and i used to go in with questions for my appointments Mm -hmm. um and i know i mean this was at the beginning this was when covid was there so there were obviously a lot of restrictions and all of that um and i had to have uh you know i'd write down my questions that I had because I'd looked online and done my research and all that. I knew my symptoms, everything. But I knew that, you know, maybe I'd only get through the first three of my questions, but I had eight. (laughs) I put my top three that I wanted absolutely answered were there. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'd say, listen, I have a couple of questions. Is that okay if I ask you them? Go through the first three. And if I knew I was tracking okay on time, I'd say, I've got a few more, is that okay? If I didn't and they were really important, Mm-hmm. Then say I've got a few more. Is it okay if I ask them to you next time, or is there another way that I can get them to you, mm-hmm. um, and go that way? Because it was they were important to me. Because if I didn't get them answered, I'd go away, and actually my sense of anxiety would be raised. Yeah, um, and I'd feel very uncertain, um, especially during that time. This was like April 2020. Mm-hmm. So I think it's important to, as you said, start from the beginning Mm -hmm. of a patient journey and be aware of what you can do to Mm -hmm. contribute towards your health and healthcare. Yeah. I'm starting to appreciate the stigma that's associated with um, living through a serious illness, but yet things aren't quite right. And you're not the same, but Mm -hmm. you're not imminently going anywhere. Um, so it's like, what does the healthcare system do, or what does society do with mm. people who yep. um, who live on? Yeah, who need resources, yep. but it's not as dire. I think what I've learned or what was really clear was it's not just about brain tumor, it's a brain injury. And when you think of brain injuries, you can have brain injuries from all kinds of things, concussions, car accidents, falling down in a funny way. And so that it's the, it's a similar impact. I mean, obviously not all the, the surgery part, but the, the lifelong implications of how it affects your life and, and the hidden disabilities and every other part of that. And and you still have to have a team approach when you have a brain injury because Mm -hmm. your life is different. So I think, Mm -hmm. um, it isn't just about, you know, life limiting. Um, well, it yeah. is, but, but these are, but serious illness and the way we traditionally think about it, there's, you know, the tentacles go out far. So no, Claire, thing is the same. you mentioned um, that you're on different, um, I guess, communities uh, or peer groups. How important was that throughout your journey? I can't even explain how important that was mm-hmm. uh, from the get go. Mm -hmm. Uh, the day I was diagnosed or probably the day afterwards I went online looking for some form of Mm -hmm. who's out there who has this and I found Facebook 
mm -hmm. uh, support group specifically for individuals who had the same brain tumor that I had. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because when I joined, I think there were 300 and it's global, obviously 300 individuals. And today there's over three and a half thousand individuals. Mm -hmm. And it was instrumental, instrumental mm -hmm. for me because I could suddenly ask questions. I could ask questions about symptoms, anything. It was unbelievable for me to be able to have that peer to peer support. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, from diagnosis, then when I got ill, acutely ill prior to my surgery, after my surgery as well. And then also that in-person mm -hmm. peer-to-peer support, going to a uh, support group mm -hmm. um, has been amazing. I've made so many good connections and friends mm -hmm. through that, that I keep in contact with. Um, it's, I, it's, it's honestly is a fundamental arm, I think of any, uh, chronic illness and especially life limiting illness I think is having that because as supportive as my husband and my family were they weren't mm -hmm. walking in the same shoes that I was walking and I didn't want to every time say oh my gosh I'm so worried about this or the, the, you know but to, to have somebody who could understand that was was amazing it is it's great to hear you talk about um, how supportive that was for your journey mm -hmm. and there's it, it, not equally, but a, a, a large portion of people who, again, this goes back to know your style, um, who I hear say, you know, that's really not for me. Um, I'm a very private person, or um, they might say, I don't want to air my dirty laundry, or you know what, those groups, they tend to scare you. They scare you with all their, it's like when um, moms say, you know, well, let me tell you what my delivery was like to a, a pregnant woman, you know, they're yeah. horror stories. Um, so do you think for some people it works and for other people um, it might not work or should we force everyone into these peer groups? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> it's a good question. So I, I can hear where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be a little scary and a little eye-opening. And I know I sort of withdrew from the one support group, the online one a little bit at certain times when it got a bit too much. When I was in the diagnosis phase and I was hearing all about the surgeries and what went wrong afterwards and I was like whoa the too much information mm -hmm. um but then after my surgery it was instrumental because I was really struggling mm -hmm. um in the in-person support group there's some people who don't say one word when they come there but they just sit and they listen yeah and mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing for people to know you don't have to say anything you can yeah. just sit and listen it could yeah. be about hearing things, hearing other stories. I mean, that's as humans, how we connect. We connect by hearing stories of other people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we can read the, the, the literature and understand our condition from a medical perspective. Mm -hmm. But when we hear other people's stories from a lived experience, it's a very different lens we're looking at. And we can hear the good, the bad and the ugly too, but it's a very different lens we're hearing it from. And that's how we connect from a human perspective. And for me, that's, mm -hmm. that's really, really important. It makes us feel like we're not alone. Yeah. And, and so we can just listen. We can participate. There's both sides of the coin. And I think that's important for people to know in peer support. Another important organization that you're involved in is the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. So I'd love to, if you can talk a little bit about that organization and, and sure. what you feel so passionate about. That's a pleasure to do. <laughs> because uh, I've been lucky enough I've volunteered for the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada for about seven years I volunteer on their Brainwave program which is um, a program for families with uh, children that have brain tumors um, and so they're a national organization uh, and their mission really is to reach any person in Canada each and every person in Canada who's affected by a brain tumor and they do this via they do support they do educational materials online and they do these fantastic books for individuals um, and they do a lot of research and grants and funding as well um, and support groups and you know for me they're really really important because I think a lot of people don't know enough about brain tumors uh, I didn't I knew about cancer and I knew all of this I actually didn't know much about brain tumors. Mm -hmm. um, but there's over 120 different types of brain tumors, which is a, that's a lot. And I think it doesn't, what that may, means is it makes treatment really tricky. And so when you look at 
the amount of research and funding that goes into brain tumors and brain tumor research and treatments, it actually doesn't uh, sort of match up to the, the money that's really needed to go in there. I mean, if we actually look at the stats, um, I think it is, I was just having a look at it. I mean, uh, if we look at uh, brain tumors, is actually the leading cause of solid cancer death in children under the age of 20. Mm. I don't think people actually realize that. Um, so that's why I always continue to support uh, and volunteer for the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada because they're doing so much in this area. And I think it's important to raise awareness about brain tumors and raise funding for brain tumors and research and all of that. So yeah, I think they're a great organization. They have a fantastic volunteer network and really strong and passionate people working within the organization as well. So yeah, if you want to find out any more about them, they've got a great website. It's braintumor.ca. So you can have a peek there. We often like to leave the last word to our speakers. Like what advice do you have for patients and families who are starting a journey that you've learned that that you'd want to share with them? Hmm. I would say is last word of advice is um, breathe in the small things Mm -hmm. and um, take things day by day because sometimes it can be very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that. And I do think is look for ways to do that team approach but also gather your family and your care team. And I'm talking here about your your doctors, your healthcare providers and support groups Mm -hmm. into that whole approach. And as we were discussing, try and do it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Don't leave it to the end. And I think that dovetails nicely with what you're trying to do with palliative care. Let's Mm -hmm. not leave that conversation to the end. Let's bring that conversation into the beginning as well. So I think it's about if you are diagnosed with a life-limiting or really serious illness, think about it from the beginning and what steps can you be taking to become more educated about it, to look for ways to understand what that means and ask questions from the get-go and be more involved, whether it's you as a patient or whether it's your care partner or your spouse or family or friend. Claire, what advice would you have for someone who is living with a brain tumor? Um, best advice, you know what, um, the best advice for someone who has a brain tumor is I feel like everything is done on brain time. Brain is so different from everything else. Um, Mm -hmm. it requires, um, for me, it was like, I needed lots of sleep, lots of everything. So I'm highly respectful of my brain Mm -hmm. when it needs to slow down. It tells my body it's got to slow down. So for me, I remember the word brain time is to be highly respectful of my brain. That's one of the things I always remember. To listen to your body. Well, this has been such an interesting um, conversation with someone who's lived through it uh, and still has a hidden disability. And to know a little bit more about what it's like to walk in your shoes, Claire, and how you um, are just that kind of person who has turned this all into a way to help so many other people. So, I mean, the world is so grateful for people like you. You're just so generous. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for what you guys are doing. I continue to listen to your show. And I have the one from Australia pegged to Mark. (laughs) Claire, it's been a pleasure talking with you today. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website, waitingroomrevolution.com to listen to our first season about the seven keys and to learn more. The podcast is produced and edited by me and Kayla McMillan. Our theme music is Maypole by Ketza. Please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast and help us get the word out.